Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another episode of the show. So for today's show, we're gonna do a couple wines here I bought here in San, well, I bought them all in San Antonio, but um, uh, kind of for people who live in San Antonio to go and check out, let's put it that way, all right? So um, instead of going to one of the uh, more national branded uh, retailers that we have in town, um, or statewide. Well, HEB is kind of statewide, but anyway. So, um, might help if I start of the clock on this, so I know where I'm at. So, anyway, um, I have a few of my followers, basically based in San Antonio, that have uh, really um, been bugging me to uh, try this particular wine. I'm just going to move the little pad over, so I don't have any issues with things flying around. All right, sorry about that, moving everything around here. All right, so uh, props for a little bit later. Let's get right into this wine here. Now this is the non-vintage cul-de-sac Cabernet Sauvignon from the cul-de-sac wine company uh, out of California. Uh, this was bought for $2.98 from HEB. I bought it at the Central Market HEB, but it's available at all HEBs. Um, it's an American uh, AVA as far as the Appalachian, American Appalachian. So what does that mean? Well, I'm about to find out. Well, if you uh, had watched one of the Wine 101s recently, we talked about AVAs. Um, that means the grapes technically have to come from anywhere in the United States. Now, this is interesting because um, we'll get into the history of who this, who this company is, but basically, um, is a company out of California? And if they had gotten at least seven, no, I'm sorry, 85% of their grapes from California, they could have called it California wine. So methinks at least 16% of the grapes came from outside of California, which is possible. They could have gotten them from Oregon or Washington, you know, or anywhere else. But um, anyway, so let's get into it. Um, I've read a few things on the internet and people have kind of been describing this as the, uh, uh, what H-E-B, and there's another, um, Somebody else, uh, I actually think it was um, it was uh, Whole Foods, I think somewhere else was carrying this. Somewhere else was carrying this. And uh, it was, quote, their answer to Trader Joe's Charles Shaw, which is affectionately known, depending on what part of the country you are, two buck, three buck, or four buck chuck. Don't know if we're gonna call this a three buck sack, but <clears throat> we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna check it out. All right, so. Um, First of all, let's take a look at the color. I mean, it's not too bad. It's a little bit, it's uh, pretty see-through, pretty light. You know, most cabs are a little bit deeper. Um, it says Cabernet Sauvignon, so it has to be at least 75% Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, the other 25% other could be anything else. Um, again, we'll get into some of the stuff about the wine, about the Scooter Winery. Um, viscosity, well, I don't know. Let's see. As far as... Rim variation, it's, it goes out to pretty clear, kind of watery. You know, viscosity as well. Again, if I really, really got to coat this glass, I guess, to get any type of indication of viscosity, but it's, it's pretty high, pretty high viscosity. Uh, let's check out what the uh, alcohol is. It's 12 and a half, so it's not too bad on alcohol. Let's see what the nose is like. Pretty basic nose. It smells just like a red wine. <laughs> um, I get a bit of smoke to it. Some minerality. Um, 
kind of hard candy, red, you know, red fruit, hard candy type of uh, smell. I mean, nothing unpleasant about the nose. Just nothing spectacular about the nose, especially considering it's supposed to be a cab, so you're kind of thinking a little bit bigger. Detect wood, so we got that going on. All right, so let's check out the palette. Lots of cherry to it, cherry-like stuff to it. Uh, it really tastes wood. Um, kind of sweet. It's got the sweetness, not not a sweet wine, but there's a sweetness to it. It's a little fruit forward, um, but it tastes like wood and fruit, like fruit roll-up. Um, so it's got that processed um, fruitiness, like a strawberry or cherry fruit roll-up that was laying exposed in a cedar box. Is it a bad wine? No, it's not a it's not a horrible wine. But it's a wine. It's a $3 bottle of wine that um, it's about as good as three buck Chuck. Um, it's, it, it's really got not, not much to it. I mean, the, the wood seems to be a little too much for me. The cedar box, um, it's kind of, it's got a bit of, of tartness to it, a little bit of sourness to it. Uh, the bottle has been open for a long time, just so you know. Uh, I opened these bottles while I was watching the Tour de France this morning, and I've been kind of lazy getting around to recording this, and now I realize it's 4 o'clock. Good Lord, I thought it was about 3 o'clock. But... So these have been open for quite a while, both wines that we're reviewing today. So plenty of time to air, even if it's only a little bit of surface area. Um, maybe I'll to the cover, the cover decanting in a Wine 101 future one. And I do have to say that one of the reasons why I was not really rushing to get these wines reviewed is one of the people who reviewed this particular wine said at first it was really kind of very, very kind of sweet and fruity and you know ble you know not really that good, and then he let it sit out for a little bit, a couple hours later, and it, it, it tasted more like a cab. Honestly, what I what I identify this as a cab, I don't know. I'm shot in the dark maybe, but it's really light. So I would probably think that it was some type of Merlot Pinot Noir blend. Um, I mean, it, it, it tastes, they, they could have slapped just American red wine on there and I would have been like, okay, it's very generic. You know, I'd, I'd probably score this, I, I'd, you know. Would I necessarily buy it again? If you want like some wine just to have around, just a drink that's cheap and you've got, a bunch of other wines out there to choose from that are twice the price, buy this one. Um, to me, it's about as good as any $6 bottle of wine, um, upwards of $7, you know, for the same type of, same type of what you're getting. I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of in agreement that it's pretty much um, targeted at uh, the Trader Joe's that are going to start, are starting to crop up in Texas. And so all those people that go out and buy the Charles Shaw, H-E-B and, uh, uh, not world, I wasn't going to call it world market. Um, the other one, uh, anyway, uh, H-E-B and, uh, how can I, how can I forget the other, whatchamacallit, other supermarket. Anyway, they're, they're out there trying to make sure that they're getting people to come into their stores to buy value, super value, extreme value priced wines. Because that's what these are. Give it an 80. It's, it's okay. It's, there's nothing particularly 
faulty about the wine. It's not um, what I would think a uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is supposed to taste like. I did buy the other two wines they have. I bought a Merlot and a, and a Chardonnay. So very likely you'll see them on upcoming episodes. Um, maybe not the next two. May like kind of space it out a bit. So um, 80 like I said, $3. You're looking for something cheap to serve, you know, for a party. You know, kind of like how I view Charles Shaw. If you want to bring a bring some wine to a party or have it as, or you're having a party, you want to you want to have a lot of wine, and you don't really have a lot of wine connoisseurs. You just want a beverage that people can drink. They don't. They just know that there's red and white wine. And they don't really care about wine. This is the type of wine that you would serve. And not that you're trying to serve your guests junk, but if they're not going to appreciate the twenty or twenty-five dollar bottles of wine. And they're not going to be able to tell the difference. You can serve this. It's a little bit on the sweet side for me. Um, so an 80 is about what I'd go. All right, so let's talk about who is the cul-de-sac winery. Now, I had to do a little digging. Now, I'm not trying to say that I'm better at finding stuff out than some of the other wine reviewers that reviewed this wine. But nobody could tell me who cul-de-sac winery was as far as reading their reviews. I only read about three reviews, or maybe four. And there weren't that many out there to begin with for this wine. Um, but doing this little Google search, I found the Ohio website that, uh, which I don't think I kept. Oh yeah, I did. So, um, the Ohio, the Ohio alcohol, whatever regulatory, um, body, um, they, uh, had it on their website about who was approved to distribute and when they were approved. And, uh, so guess who makes this? It's called the wine group. Now, who's the wine group? Well, um, they have a lot of uh, they have a lot of wines. They are the third largest uh, wine wine company in the world. Um, sorry, third or second? They're the third largest, I believe. Let me look at their press release about something else, which is from about four years ago. But anyway, they're, they're either the number two or the number three winemaker in the world behind uh, Gallo and, uh, oh, Constellation, they're the third, I'm sorry, third largest by volume behind Constellation and Gallo. Uh, they were founded in 1981 by a management buyout of the wine assets of the Coca-Cola Bottling Company of New York, now part of Coca-Cola Enterprises. Now I'm not saying Coca-Cola owns it, but part of a buyout, um, uh, the assets, anyway, so they, they bought it out. Uh, its origins are in the Franzia Brothers Winery. So, the same people that make Franzia make this. They also make Cupcake, Big House, I'm just naming a few, Con Cannon, uh, Fish Eye, another one that we've seen, Flip Flop, another one that's kind of new, kind of a little hip from a few years ago, Glen Ellen, um, see Ingle Nook. They also make Mogan David, Monticello, um, Oak Leaf, where you can find in your local Walmart. Uh, Paul Masson, Pinot Evil, that's another one that you've seen quite a bit of. Um, and Silver Birch, I'm trying to think if there's any others that were, that kind of, that kind of uh, really <clears throat> uh, jumped out at me. Not really, they, they make quite a few, quite a few wines. So, with that said, that means that they also, um, uh, they also have uh, access to a lot of juice. So this is very likely the extra juice that was from all or some of these other wineries that was kind of like, well, this, it, it's extra juice, it's bulk. It maybe wasn't from the, maybe those grapes weren't to the level of what they wanted for those particular wines. So they have extra, so let's ferment it and just make up a name. So there's cul-de-sac winery doesn't exist uh it says uh bottled vented and bottled in livermore and ripon california which apparently are really far away from each other so it's not like there's um it's not like you know it's like one little nice little chateau somewhere despite the french looking chateau label so um and then on the front it says friendship laughter skin knees badminton on the lawn, barbecue on the deck at Cold the Sack Wine Company, we raise a glass to good neighbors and good wines. Well, like I said, basic wine, if you're looking for something pretty inexpensive, $3. That's gonna do it for this segment. We're gonna move on to the next wine that hopefully will be a lot better. All right, and we're back with the next wine here. So um, 
backstory in this one. Uh, as you, you probably remember, if you're a somewhat long-term viewer, or at least a viewer for a few episodes of, of the show, uh, you might have remembered that I had Ceci Barreto on a few times. Uh, most recently, uh, she came over and we tried a few wines. We did that Twitter tasting. And then I've also been over to uh, her wine shop with her partner, Melissa. And um, so having those wines, oh, the, fell, uh, scraped off in the back. Anyway, so um, not that I don't know what's, what this is all about. So I called her up the other day and I was like, hey, are you going to be open on the 4th of July? Because on my, quote, day job, I am off uh, Wednesday and Thursday for a couple weeks, uh, or was. And um, typically I'm off on Sundays and Mondays. This is usually when I record the episodes and then put them up. Well, um, she normally only opens the shop from Tuesday through Saturday. So guess when I work is when she has a shop open. So I don't even get a chance to uh, head over to the shop. So I was like, hey, you're going to be open? And she was like, no, but I'm going to work on my thesis, which very interesting conversation we had about her thesis. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, checking it out when she gets it done. But anyway, so she uh, was kind enough to um, uh, take, get some wines from her shop and uh, have me take a look at them. Uh, we luckily live near each other. And um, so this is one of the bottles that I chose because I wanted to have some premium wines and wanted to buy some from her because I haven't had a chance really to get anything recently. So uh, this was one of the selections that we had. This is the Elise uh, 2008 Lingenue. Uh, uh, yeah, Lingenue. Uh, it's a white wine from the Sierra Foothills. Uh, and this bottle is heavy especially compared to that other bottle. You know, why, why, why was that three, uh, 298? Because the bottle is small. Here, matter of fact, I'll give you a comparison. They're both the same size bottle or same, to contain the same amount of wine. Okay, but this bottle is significantly lighter, um, so costs probably a lot less. This is a much thicker bottle. Um, very much, very likely it costs more. I, um, so this is from, like I said, Sierra Foothills, uh, the Elise Winery, and um, the vineyard is the Nagyar, or Nagyar, Nagyar, not really sure, N-A-G-G-I-A-R, Nagyar, 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 no, no, I should have asked Ceci how to pronounce it, because it's obviously they're French influenced here, uh, vineyard, and uh, this is in, and I thought I had the vineyard pulled up. I didn't, but we'll go. We'll go. We'll talk about the winery real quick. Uh, the winery was named after Ray and Nancy Corson's daughter Elise. They also have a, name, uh, a son named Jacob that they have a separate wine line, or wine line of wines. Um, but Elise was their daughter, or is their daughter, and uh, they named the wine a winery after her. Um, they they came to California in 1983 from Cape Cod, and um, then Ray kind of did some work, uh, they got a bed and breakfast, and he kind of did some sideline work with a couple wineries. One of them was Whitehall Winery. And after a few years, actually I think it was nine years, um, they opened up uh, their own winery. Uh, actually, they started the winery four years later, but they really, kinda, I guess, got into it more, more uh, after he was really, had a lot of uh, experience from Whitehall and started making these uh, wines. They actually, I think, bought yeah, they were using what's called Custom Crush, which um, if you remember, if you're a long time viewer of the show, you remember uh, Cindy Costco from Passaggio Wines, um, and she actually, her, her quote, day job is um, over at um, Crush Pad, one of those Custom Crush facilities in San Francisco. Actually, I think they actually moved the facilities to Napa, but they have offices in San Francisco now. So they used to use the Custom Crush people or facilities, and in 97, they purchased a small winery and vineyard on Hoffman Lane, and uh, so now they have the Elise Winery. So what is this wine? Uh, it's a white wine, obviously. Uh, it is uh, in the Grass Valley, or Najir Vineyard, Grass Valley, Sierra Foothills. Um, it is 36, this particular vintage, 2008, oh, bought it for $36 uh, from Ceci. Um, actually, this was on sale, but regularly priced $36. Um, and it wasn't that I got a special discount. It was just a normal discount. 36% uh, Roussan, 35% Viognier, 20% Marsan, and 9% Grenache Blanc. Uh, it is aged for 16 months sur lis, basically aged on lees, um, in what they called experienced French oak barrels. 
So what that tells me is they weren't new barrels, which means they're not, they don't want the barrels to necessarily impart a lot of flavors or characteristics to the wine. They want to let the wine age on its own and probably let the yeast, which is the lees, the dead yeast cells, um, influence the characteristics. 14.5% uh, alcohol is what they say. All right, so let's take a look at the wine here. Uh, pretty high viscosity. And it's, you know, very golden, golden color, you know, golden straw color. Clear. Don't see any faults in it. It's a lot easier with white wines to kind of go, oh, it's clear, no faults. I mean, but you can see it with reds too. Wow. Very fruit forward wine, kind of honeysuckle, honeyish, like honey, like honeydew melon and honey, and probably honeysuckle flower too, which, you know, it's all about the honey on this one. Yeah, and kind of apricotish. It's almost like a very subtle um, dessert wine type of nose. Really nice, really, and it, it smells kind of sweet. So let's see if it's actually a sweet wine or not. All right, first of all, I'm gonna say it, it's definitely that fruit forward. I get the same flavor profile, but it's not sweet, but I get a really nice medium high acidity to it. I mean, mouth is really watering, and that's one of your indications of how acidic and uh, acidic and acid, acidic a wine is, is, is your mouth just really watering after, after you taste it, which you get more with white wines than reds, but you can get them with red wines. I get kind of, I do get that, that a good bit of creaminess out of it. And that actually is, um, while, while the wood can contribute to creaminess, um, you get this body, this, this, this mouth feel, this texture and this creaminess is actually coming from the lees. Um, that's why they do that. Now what they do is, um, you know, the, the yeast, you know, the ferments and it falls to the bottom of the, um, falls to the bottom of the barrel or the fermentation tank or whatever they're, whatever they're storing it in at this point, aging it. And what they do is they, they'll stir the lees, batonnage, if I remember correctly, is the, uh, is the term. But what it is, it, it kind of stirs things up, so it kind of mixes the lees in there, so it kind of, you know, it, it, it settles back down instead of just less, instead of just the lees being the very bottom. So they will, they will um, occasionally stir the wine or cause the wine to kind of mix up with the, with the lees. That way you get that, that creaminess. Uh, it's a different type of creaminess, not like a, not like a, a wood creaminess, but you get like this uh, mouthfeel to it. Really, really digging this wine. This is very much in a, in a style of a white Rhone wine. These are varietals that are found or grown in Rhone. Um, and so this is very much like a wine you would get from there. Uh, that, that creaminess is really, really nice. It's a uh, decent body. I mean, the finish is, I'd say a medium finish. I think it's an excellent, excellent wine. Um, if I chilled it a little bit, it'd probably be even better, but honestly at room temperature, I think it's really showing extremely well. It's allowing, it's allowing that the flavors and the aroma, the aromas to really come out instead of being hidden by temperature. Because sometimes with white wines at room temperature, they, they're a little harsh. The acidity might be a little high, everything's just a little harsh, but you can kind of see that if the wine is really good or not. In this case, this is easily wine you could drink if the house is at 70, 72 degrees, 73 degrees, you know, quote, room temperature. Um, but if you chilled it, you know, 10 degrees, you know, so it's like about 65 degrees, not 10 degrees, but if you guys are on 65, 62 degrees, phenomenal, especially in a hot Texas summer. Yeah. If you've got 36 bucks and you're looking for a really nice white wine to get, highly recommend this one. And not because it says he's my friend, but if you live in San Antonio, 
go to Ceci's Wine Shop, and I'll have the link below, but Venice speaking, uh, a fine wine shop. So I'll have the link below. Uh, you need to go and check her out. If you're in the area, go buy the wine from her. Give her some business. Um, absolutely awesome. Okay, so real quick. Um, let me move this out of the way. So the other day, uh, and eventually I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a, a and it, this is going to be one of those things where like these other podcasts will create kind of, um, or shows will create uh, other shows that don't really deal with the subject of, of what you normally do. So like wine, but I'm probably going to create a video in the next, I don't know, month or so about how to do what I do. Okay. Um, but one of the things, and over time you've seen all my little accessories, but um, what I did the other day is batteries. Now, uh, I have a backpack that I use. I've had this backpack for years, actually. It was just more of a backpack I used when I live in Chicago. Um, but um, it's now become kind of my equipment backpack where I stuff everything I need for the podcast is in this backpack. I'll show you that. I keep looking over at it. I'll show you that backpack at some point. Um, but uh, this one thing, you know, if you're going to be kind of ultra portable about stuff, you should get something like that. But instead of having my batteries just... just uh, kind of laying around the bottom of the backpack and, uh, and especially the terminals connecting with each other and, and you know, bad things happen when, that, when you do that. Um, I did Google searches for uh, compartments for batteries. So the container store, go figure, has got these things and they're, they're really cheap, like $2. So what I did for, for my purposes, I bought two of these uh, for D cells. Um, now they have ones that have multiple battery things and they're great and all, but I have these batteries. These are the batteries I use for the LED lights that light the set. Um, and they, uh, I forgot how much these were, but um, I have nine of these batteries. I have three lights, nine batteries, so I can change out three times. And, um, you know, they fit really, they fit really well in here. I don't know if you can see that. Um, I also have, uh, besides the battery that's in the ZI-8, I've got two other spare ones in case I don't, like I use the outlet for this when I'm at home, but in case I'm out in the field, I have a battery and I've got three batteries, so I've got plenty of that. I've got my, um, if now I've got the lavalier hooked into the Zoom, which uh, I don't know if I've shown you that, but this is the audio now, how I record. And uh, I don't want to unplug it because then I'll lose the audio quality. But um, this is the Zoom H1, yeah, H1, uh, 100 bucks, $99 excellent quality for, for what it does. I mean, they have a higher, like $150 one that's supposed to be much better, but I'm sorry, my, my audio sounds tons better now. Um, but like if I'm using, say if I'm not using this, I want to use the wireless mic. Um, I've got the nine volts, which is kind of funny because I bought the Zoom about two weeks after I bought these rechargeable nine volts, which, you know, are great because then I'm not spending all this money on nine volt batteries. So, um, highly recommend the nine volts if you have the wireless setup because especially with the Asden, you have no idea how the battery strength is. And while they supposedly should last, you know, at least two or three, four, five hours on a battery. Um, you know, when I'm recording these things, sometimes I record a few shows in a row and it takes like three or four hours and then I have to replace the battery. So the uh, rechargeables are great. And then, uh, I got another one for the remaining batteries for the lights. And then I've got my double A's in there, which these are still the old double A's I have. I bought a bunch of the, the Dynex ones at Best Buy um, that powers the Zoom. Anyway, uh, but I bought some more rechargeables. Rechargeables are the way to go because it, even though initially they're expensive, they, uh, they make up in the long run the price. So I just want to share that real quick. I uh, went a little long. Uh, buy the wine. Uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, what are we talking about? Oak. Yes. We're going to be talking about oak and what it does to wine and why we use oak instead of other woods. So stay tuned. Right the little with the, with the curtains. Stay tuned. We're going to talk about oak. All right. So we're back and uh, we're going to talk all about oak. All right. So all about oak. Now that I've got the slide up on my computer here. Um, so what does oak do to wines and why do we use oak and not other woods or do we use other woods well let's find out okay all right so uh why oak well versus other woods um one of the things about oak is the, the grain of the of the wood it's much tighter than 
most other woods. Um, and what that does is it allows a gradual extraction of flavors. Now, wood will impart certain flavors to wine. Um, depending on the wood, depends on some of the flavors that, that get imparted on the wine. But if the grain is not very tight, um, if it's loose grain, I guess, um, the wine gets absorbed, uh, or the, the wood really interacts, absorbs the wine like a sponge uh, a lot better than if it's really tight. Um, minimal evaporation, uh, also oxidation. Now, you need, we talk about oxygen is bad for wine. So if I left the, the wines that I opened, if I left them open overnight, um, actually they won't hurt them too much. Um, but if I left them open, say for two, three, four days, and left them out, or I had a glass of wine and I left it out overnight, it's gonna taste pretty bad the next day. Oxygen is, you know, an enemy to wine. Except that it's also its friend. So you need to have a little bit of oxidation. So it's called micro-oxidation, micro okay? Um, so you need a little bit of oxidation, but you don't need a lot. So minimal evaporation, um, so you don't want, so the wine is tight enough so that it doesn't leak, which I have somewhere, yeah, it doesn't leak um, as part of the grains, but um, it has a little bit of oxidation going on. High wood tannins. Now we keep talking about tannin and grapes and the, and the stems and the pips and the skins, but woods have uh, their own tannin. They're called uh, elegotannins, okay? And um, that's very important in helping uh, with the storage of wine, with uh, how wine is, um, how the wine is aged. If you have very low wood tannins, then the wine tends to be a lot harsher. If you have high wood tannins, it tends to soften the wine a little bit. Um, wood is, uh, oak is also easily to work with. Um, it, it's, it's pliable enough that you can bend it. So you know, you've got these oak barrels and they're shaped, you know, they've got a bit of bend to it. They're not just straight boxes. And why they make them barrels like that instead of straight, I don't know. But I um, should have looked that up, why they're, they're shaped the way they are. But um, other woods are either too pliable, and so, again, there's, there's a leakage issue, whether it's air or actually leakage of the wine, or they're too stiff, they're too brittle, and you can't make them into barrels. And then, uh, honestly, wood out of most of the other wood, or oak out of most of the other woods, uh, imparts probably the most pleasant characteristics, at least to the, our palates. All right, so what other woods have we have uh, there been used before? Um, redwood uh, is considered too rigid and it gives too much of a yellow tint to wine. Chestnut, um, the tannin is high, but it's too porous. And they'll, what they do is and they, they'll, they'll use chestnut. Uh, they'll, they'll, do, they'll put paraffin on the inside, kind of like a wax to help prevent it from uh, the wine from leaking and being too porous. Um, it was it's, it's historically used in Beaujolais, uh, Italy and Portugal. Apple and cherry wood, uh, another, another couple of woods that have been used in the past, but apparently there's too much of a off-putting smell to it. And then acacia, uh, which was used in Austria a lot, uh, gives too much of a yellow tint. But again, it, it's, it's, a wine, it's a barrel that's been used or an oak that's been used. All right, so let's talk about the differences between French and American oak. All right, French oak, um, it kind of has become the standard of oak, and it's been used for centuries at this point. Um, there, are there are five main forests in France that they get oak from. Uh, you have Limousine, Alliers, Valsages, uh, Troncaille, and Nevers, or Tronquet, uh, and Nevers, or Nevers, I don't know. Um, they, uh, French oak typically has very tight grain. Um, it's called, and what they use, they hand split it. Now, what that means is that the grains, um, the, the way the grains are, or the way the oak is, not designed, but how, how it's structured, is that if they use a machine to, to uh, cut it or split it, you're, you're breaking up too much of the structure in the wood, and that's bad. There's these, there's like basically these tubes inside, um, the, the wood, and if you break them up too much, uh, the, the grain gets too loose or it's not as tight. So you have to hand split it along the grain so everything is nice, okay? So it doesn't, it doesn't mess it up. Uh, has higher tannin than American oak. Uh, so has more extraction of phenolics. So that's your taste, your color, your mouthfeel. 
uh, it's quote less oaky. So as far as the wood flavor, it doesn't impart as much wood flavor on it. Um, Mouthfeel, it kind of has a silkiness to it and also has a bit of a sweetness to it, uh, to the wine. And then you'll get what's called baking spices, uh, things like cloves and cinnamon, okay, nutmeg. That's a, a typically a characteristic that French oak was used. Um, and it's also more expensive, like many times more expensive than American oak. All right, so American oak, uh, it's the new kid on the block. Um, 18 states, at least that's the, the best number I could come up with, actually grow oak that's used for wine barrel making. Uh, a lot of the eastern United States, Appalachia, the Midwest, and then Oregon. Um, I won't go through all the states, but some of the states that were mentioned were Missouri, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Virginia, uh, Kentucky. So, um, but 18 states in all, including Oregon. The grain is a little bit looser, okay? So... Um, it's got a little bit more uh, chance for evaporation uh, and oxidation. Like I said, it's machine cut. So <clears throat> again, the structure of, of, the, uh, of the grain is such that when you, if you use a machine just to cut it, they can cut it however they want. They don't have to be careful, so they're not breaking up the, the structure too much. Uh, it has a lower tannin, but it produces more flavor and what they call perfume. Um, it's also oaky due to higher non-tannic phenols, okay? So um, you'll get more of that wood type of flavor. Uh, it's considered a little bit harsher, a little bit bolder, and less sweet. You'll get um, vanilla is the number one characteristic that you'll get from uh, American oak. That and dill, which I honestly don't get a lot of dill from any wine, but dill and also depending on how you want to look at this dill can, can kind of be considered a fault we're going to be we're going to be covering faults soon about all kinds of faults in wine not just corked wine but all types of faults uh coconut and then suntan lotion that's also kind of that coconut thing but the, those are other things that um typically indicate american oak was used uh, it's also a lot it's a lot more inexpensive a lot less expensive than uh french oak all right so what other oaks have been used like slovenian oak uh, similar to French structurally, it has less tannin. It's used mostly for storage, um, and they'll use it as a neutral container. So it's 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 barrels or the barrels that are old, or they'll use them for like really large barrels. Okay, for like storage containers. All right, um, Hungarian again. It's also similar to French structurally, has less tannin, but it gives you a soft, creamy mouth texture. Uh, Czech oak. Uh, it has usually a sweet, nutty flavor. The tannins are moderate, and then it has a it imparts a floral characteristic to the wine, um, and it's called the mimosa flower. I never knew the mimosa flower existed. I just thought mimosa was a drink. Okay, um, so don't ask me what the mimosa flower is like. I honestly didn't look it up. I was just like, interesting. There's a flower called mimosa. I'm sure that's why. I bet you mimosa is probably an orangey type of flower. Has orange characteristics because it's that's what a mimosa is. Russian oak, uh, more intense than French. It's similar in profile, though not as sweet. All right, cooperage. Now that's the act of creating the barrels. Um, now, woods have varietals, okay? There, there's different versions of French oak and American oak, and even those five forests, um, each of those forests, now within the forest there's differences, but each forest has kind of certain characteristics. So. Um, depending on who's making the wine, you might see these things talk about, oh, they use limousine oak. And now from my readings in the past, limousine seemed to be kind of like the top oak uh, forest, top forest in France to get oak barrels from. Um, but the other four forests are, you know, the, they each have, I guess, certain characteristics. Um, you also have seasoning. Now seasoning, you have two types. You have natural and kiln fired. Natural is... Basically, they, they, cut, they cut the trees down, they create the staves, you know, that they're gonna um, create the oak barrels out of. They've already done all the cutting, and then they leave them outside, believe it or not, for like 18, you know, a year to year and a half. They leave them outside to be exposed to the elements. Now, what this does is it rains, it gets, it gets sunny, it gets humid, and it, it seasons the oak. All that exposure is kind of like, you know, making Madeira wine or sherry. Um, the, the, the exposure to the elements instead of in a nice, cool, protected cellar 
um, affects the wine. Well, same thing for the wood. Now, you have kiln fired, which what that does is it's supposed to um, create the same sense of, of seasoning, but from what I've read, it doesn't really do the exact same thing, okay? Now you have toasting. Now in the kiln, they will toast the barrels. You have light, medium, and heavy. Now each cooper um, will create, has their own style of toasting. Each cooper may have a specialty. They may specialize in medium toasting. So if you get a light toasted barrel or a heavy toasted barrel from them, it may not be as good in quality as the medium toast. Um, their heavy toast is going to be different than, say, somebody who specializes in heavy toasting. So um, you need to know the cooper pretty well as to what you want out of your wine as far as how they toast the barrels. Uh, you can also have no toast if you want. Uh, more toast equals less oak flavor, uh, less oak flavor and tannins, okay? Uh, high carbon, what happens is you, 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 you've toasted the, the barrel and you've created a high carbon content. So you've, you've, you've charred the, uh, the, ins you know, the inside of the barrel. Um, this creates a barrier. So the oak has less opportunity to interact with the, uh, the wine. This also means you're gonna get less color influence on the wine. So the less toast, the more the oak actually influences the wine. All right, so you've got barrels, but you know there's, they're expensive, right? And say you're a smaller winery, you can't, you can't even afford the couple hundred dollars a barrel. You know, that's how much American oak costs. You know, French oak can cost anywhere from 600 to $1,000 a barrel, depending on what year you bought it in. Um, so what are the alternatives? And you have oak chips. Um, you can use staves. Now what they do, oak chips, first of all, oak chips, they just put the chips in the wine and, just, and, it's, and um, it's a way to do oak aging to a wine without, in the, you put it like in a stainless steel or a concrete cement uh, container. You have staves. So you have the wooden staves that you attach to the inside of whatever container you're using. So there's a little bit more surface area that you're dealing with uh, as far as, or, or larger pieces of oak that you're dealing with with the wine. Uh, dust, believe it or not, they'll just have the oak grinded up into dust and they'll put it into the wine. Uh, and then you have what's called liquid oak, which I'm not really certain what exactly liquid oak is, but it was just mentioned as if I should know it. Um, but I'm gonna imagine it's like, you know, like liquid smoke that you can buy from, you know, from the grocery store to, impart the smoky flavor to your to your um, barbecue, whatever. Liquid oak's probably very much the same thing. It's probably uh, oak-infused water type of stuff, which um, in reading about all this oak stuff, they've talked about how if you go to a cooper and um, when they're doing, I guess, the uh, the toasting, I think it's the toasting process and they, they, they rinse it out with the water, that you take the water and you taste the water. It gives you an idea what the oak is going to do to the wine. And that was it. Barrel alternative. I guess that was it. <laughs> I thought I had more to talk about with, with oak here and barrels. Um, so that's going to do it for uh, the oak, for, for oak and barrels and why we use oak barrels as far as aging of wine. Uh, you can also ferment in the barrel. That's also used. Um, some places will ferment in concrete tanks or stainless steel and then they'll store it. They'll allow it to age in oak. Um, and then also can, depending on the area of the world you're in, some of it's regulated by law. Some of those places you have to age a minimum number of months or years in oak, and they also designate the type of oak. So um, it's a very, very important part of the entire winemaking process. Kind of like how yeast is very important, and, and the type of yeast you use is going to impart certain flavors uh, and aromas to the wine. Oak is another uh, part of the recipe. So. It's very important and that's why I want to talk about a lot of wineries will either use one or the other, but then you got plenty of them that use both. And again, that's again that's part of the recipe. It's part of the, the, the spices that somebody uses in a dish. So if you have partially new American oak and partially new French oak, and then the rest is, they'll tell you, sometimes they'll tell you one, two, three year or experienced oak like we had in that last wine. So there's a lot of variables in it. There isn't just one thing that you can do. And when you're trying to blind taste, you know, they talk about, well, you should detect 
American or French oak. Well, if they've used both, then you're going to get both characteristics. And that's also going to be an indicator of what type of uh, winery it was. Okay, so uh, the lights look like they're dimming. Well, the light outside is dimming. The lights look like they're dimming. I've gone a, a, quite a few minutes. We're going to finish this up today. Uh, we'll see everyone. It will be next week. I know it took a two-week time period for this one. We'll see everyone next week with another couple wines. Uh, I plan to do wine faults for uh, the um, uh, Wine 101. And uh, thank you for stopping by. Friend me up. Hit the links below to uh, visit the wineries or Sessie's Wine Shop. Hit the donate button. Throw me a couple ducats. And we'll see everyone again next time.